everybody, and welcome to Tales from the Vault. This is our wonderful YouTube channel where we talk about crazy cool things in history and do fun stuff. So, go to YouTube, type in this, hit this button, it's wonderful, subscribe, so it gets you all these cool notifications on these wonderful things we do. Tonight we're talking about this cool guy, Ben Franklin, brought to you by these people. Not really, but I work for them and they let me use this room. I feel it's the least I can do when it comes time for history. So, here we go. Tonight we're going to talk about Ben Franklin. And I'm going to start this off with a bet, okay? I'm going to bet you a wonderful, beautiful $100 bill with a familiar looking face on it if these two statements are the biggest things about Ben Franklin. Are you ready? Number one, Ben Franklin flew a kite in a thunderstorm. It was struck by electricity and Ben, or lightning, and Ben discovered electricity. Is that true? Number two, because it's a two-parter, Ben's biggest thing he helped the United States with was helping to set up the Congress and what became the foundation of our um, Constitution. Is that a true statement? If you say yes, you would have almost gotten this $100 bill, but you didn't because it's false. Ben Franklin did far, far more than that for the United States, ladies and gentlemen. Neither one of those statements is actually true, as we were told. Number one, Ben didn't fly a kite and get struck by lightning. If he did, Ben would have died. He would have exploded, basically. It's, lightning's a terrible thing. Um, and he did help with the Congress, but that wasn't the biggest thing he did to help out the United States. Ben did far, far, far more. So, let's start this storyline out. Benjamin Franklin, born January 17th, 1709, passed away at the ripe old age of 84, which is very old in the 1700s. He dies April 17th, uh, 1790. I got a couple of cheat notes down there I've been watching. Okay, so, he, so Ben's born in Boston. He's born in Boston, and he is number 15 of 17 kids. Ben has an older brother who is a printer, has a print shop in Boston. Ben, at 12 years old, becomes a printing apprentice. So Ben's biggest thing was wanting to learn how to run a printer and, and run a printing press because there was money in printing presses. Ben also loved to read. He was educated. His father wanted him to go to a higher level school but could only afford two years of schooling, but he sent him to a wonderful Latin school and Ben learned wonderful. He learns how to read. He learns how to write. Ben, while he's a printing apprentice, excuse me, had a little bit of that wine that old Ben talks about a lot. While he is a printing apprentice, he asks his brother, can I please write things and put in this newspaper? And his brother says, no, you're a printing apprentice. Absolutely not. So Ben starts thinking, how can I get my stuff published? Ben writes a series of essays, has someone else deliver them under a different name. Brother reads them and says, my God, this is genius, and he starts printing them. Ben's having a wonderful little hee-hee moment because nobody knows it's Ben Franklin. Ben's pen name for these first essays was Silence Do Good. Silence would do things like, um, she posed, it was a widow. Silence Do Good was a, a, a very old widow lady. She told girls how they should have fashion, how they should treat guys, how guys should treat girls, dating advice, uh, etiquette. All of these things, and it became such a fast following that local guys in Boston, suitors, these old men that were widows but were wealthy, were constantly going up to the newspaper trying to find them. Please tell me who Silence Do Good is. I want to marry this lady. Ben finally has to spill the beans. Silence Do Good's not real. I'm a 16 year old kid. That's who's writing all this stuff. Ha ha he he. Makes his brother mad. His brother, incidentally, also prints some things that makes the governor mad. Keep in mind, we're not at 1776 in this story, so we are not ruled by us. We are ruled by England, and if you make anybody mad in the chain of command above you, you are making the queen mad. So 
The brother printed something that the governor did not like, thought it was distasteful to the governor, so he had to throw it in jail because that's what you do when you're a tyrant you, when someone says something about you you don't like. So Ben writes a series of essays that basically says freedom of speech should be true freedom of speech and you should not be punished for publishing ideas. You should only be published for acts or, and committing treason, not for just saying independent thought. That will play out big for the U.S. later. So, but Ben's just a young kid. He's 15, 16 years old. Ben leaves Boston because his brother's in jail, runs to Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. That's because Ben comes there. It wasn't brotherly love until Ben shows up. Ben's all about bro love. Um, and he starts his own printing press. Ben becomes wealthy off this printing press. Just one printing press won't do. Ben actually goes to Europe, gets some backing, comes back, and he goes to all the colonies and he sets up the first chain of printing presses where he has multiple papers running from the Carolinas, Charleston, uh, Philly, Boston, Virginia, all of, all of the big colonies. Ben's printing the news that they're reading every day in there. So Ben's printing all that stuff. He's making big money. He makes so much money he actually retires at age 42. But that's way in the future. We want to spin this thing backwards a little bit. But I'm just saying, you know, Ben is probably the U.S.'s first entrepreneur. He is wealthy. When I tell you he's wealthy, he's not Donald Trump wealthy. He's actually higher than Elon Musk, Bill Gates wealthy, Jeff Bezos wealthy. He literally was the richest person in what would be the United States long before it was the United States and even after it became the United States. Ben had more money than anybody. Ben, luckily for us, would use his wealth while he was retired and do science experiments and do things to experiment with civic duties and stuff, and he developed some of the best systems that we enjoy today. We'll get into that in a minute. Okay, so um, Ben at age 21, he's a printer, he's a printing press, and he, he forms a group that's called the Junto. It's spelled J-U-N-T-O, but it's actually Hunto. This is a group of artisans, artists, tradesmen, hardworking people that work with their hands. So it wasn't just all about art. Ben was smart enough to bring the people with the lofty ideas and mix with the people that had to actually get the job done, the tradesmen. They mix together and they make the first civic group known to, to be in the U.S. These guys would all sit around and figure out what systems can they put in place that would educate them better, allow their jobs to be better, and still have the, art the artistic side of everything and the evolution of civics, um, you know, civic programs, whether it, it, one of the things that they actually end up doing is they lead, uh, knowledge is power. Those guys had books, but not a lot of books. But when they make this group of like 12-ish people, they allow themselves to borrow each other's book, books because they want to read each other's stuff and get more knowledge. They actually sit down and realize what a great idea this is. What if we make a public style library where the public can come and check out books and bring them back in? So we have a public library because of Ben Franklin starting a civic group. That's one thing. While we're in civic groups, Ben also starts another civic group that most guys on Thursday nights go to and train and stuff. It's called Volunteer Fire Department. Yes, the first Volunteer Fire Department, the one and only Benjamin Franklin. He did that for us, okay? Um, so back in the day, a lot of, so few people could read that if you were lucky enough or fortunate enough to win life's lottery and be born a little wealthy, you probably got to go to school, probably learn how to read, and you really accelerated past uh, sh heads and shoulders above the rest of your cohorts. So being as a civic person knew that the more people we could get to read and the more people we could educate, the more it would elevate the entire society. Instead of just a few people having the power of knowledge, spread it to the people. He was so adamant about spreading knowledge to people for free that every time Ben Franklin came up with something and made a patent, he never wanted the patent. He would never hold the rights to the patent. His inventions were to be given to the public 
so they can manipulate at their own abilities and own free will and improve his inventions to help the public out. He really didn't believe in one man designing something and owning it and having to charge everybody else for it. In his terms, it was really holding back our evolutionary process of science and society to be better people. A lot of that's still true today, if you ask me. Um, while Ben is doing uh, the, the Junto, he has his own newspapers, and one of the crazy things that he ends up writing or, or publishing is a book called um, Almanac. The poor man, uh, the, the poor poor guy's almanac, and in that was like a series of essays and all of these wives' tales or things like your grandma would tell you growing up, like the quips about life. Um, you know, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Um, there's other ones we're not going to say on here, but so basically, some of the terms we have in our English language comes from Ben publishing them. He actually had a series of essays that were called the, lady, the people that were busybodies. They were always in everybody else's business. They were never tending to their own. So hence, now we say, man, she's a real busybody. That's Ben Franklin. That's his influence on, on our literary, okay? Let's do another one. Oh, Poor Richard's Almanac. That was the name of it. I'm sorry. Um, so basically, Ben Franklin, uh, let's talk about some of the things he was. He started that first volunteer fire department. He was the first postmaster general for the United States. He was the first ambassador for the United States overseas. Ben is living this wealthy life and doing science experiments. And let's say now Ben's about 42 years old. He's at the age of retirement. Science is a big thing. He's always writing papers. Uh, one of the funny papers, he, he thought that science was going a little overboard with trying to examine everything at one time instead of concentrating on putting all of the great minds into certain directions. Like, let's let everybody concentrate on figuring out electricity. Then we'll let help the doctors. We'll all figure out health. We'll all figure out this other problem we're having. So, due to a little bit of erraticness that Ben, I think, was seeing going on, he challenged challenge the health community to study farts, as crazy as that is. There's a whole thing about that, but it's kind of funny to me. So, um, Ben makes uh, lightning rods. Let's discuss the lightning rod deal. So, people leave Europe to come to the U.S. so they have more religious, religious tolerance. You know, they, they couldn't practice their type of religion in Europe. They were kind of outlawed, pushed away. So they come over to the U.S. and a group of their people, you know, a bunch of Pentecostals, a bunch of Methodists, a bunch of Puritans, a bunch of Quakers, whatever, they would build them a church because they got to have somewhere to worship. And on the top of every church is what? Big old steeple. And on top of that steeple is that cross, trying to get it as close to God as possible, right? Well, thunderstorms are a real thing. Thunderstorms would come by strike lightning, hit the church, burn the church to the ground. Then the other religions would say, oh, well, God must not like the Quakers because he's done burned the Quakers' church down. Oh, God must not like the Pentecostals. He done flattened their church. That's one issue with it. The second issue is, is all of our structures were built out of wood. So if you struck one down to the ground and it caught fire, you would burn the majority of the town down. So Ben really wants to figure out what does it take to, to not have lightning strike these buildings. He's trying to figure out where lightning comes from, everything else. Um, the, the thing we're told in school is he flew a kite and lightning struck it and he learned about electricity. Well, that's just not true. If Ben was flying a kite and lightning struck it, he'd have died. It would have killed him. It would have been a very, very horrific death. But what Ben did do is he felt like if lightning did strike that kite, that it would run down the, the string that he was holding. So he put a piece of silk on the end of it because silk is not a conductor. It won't allow electricity to flow through it. So he's holding the silk and he ties a key on it as a weight and as a conductor. Ben reaches out from under a porch because it's raining. There's a thunderstorm going on. And when he reaches out and almost touches that key, static electricity arcs off of it, shocks him. Sticks his key out, his finger out again. Pss, pss. 
So he's realizing not only is he discharging the key, but it's, it's gaining electricity probably as fast, electrical charge, as fast as he can discharge it. So that really starts his mind spinning, and he starts to realize that um, through that and other science work too, scientists working, that we have a positive and a negative charge in our atmosphere. And when a cloud gets too much positive or too much negative, it has to, Mother Nature has to flush it out and even the score. It has to reduce the charge. So therefore, lightning strikes out of the cloud, hits the ground. The cloud then has lost its electrical charge, but the mayhem that ensues when it touches is terrible. So that leads Ben to the invention of the lightning rod, which was a metal bar or metal rod on top of the structure with some type of a wire or metal strapping to go into the dirt. So when lightning did strike that steeple, it would ground it out in the ground and not burn the church down, creating a bunch of non-scientific believers thinking that God was mad at this church. When, quite frankly, God did make the thunderstorm, but he didn't sit it out there just to take out the Puritans or the Pentecostals or the Methodists or the Quakers. It's just accurate. It just is what it is. So that's one thing Ben does for us. Uh, ben becomes an avid swimmer when he's young. He loves to exercise. He uses his time swimming to develop ways and devices to swim better. So now when you see a diver that has them big old swim fins on his feet and he's diving, that's Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin made those. That's a Ben Franklin invention. Not a form of it, not a thought process that led to it. The actual swim fins were made by Ben Franklin. So he could swim faster. Ben also, as a young kid, would take a kite tied to his boat slash canoe and use wind power to surf across ponds. But it's really hard for me to find any other documentation that says he's given credit for like kite surfing. But there's a form of it out there. It's, it's sailing. While we're on sailing, let's talk about what Ben does with sailing. Ben makes a lot of trips from the U.S. to Europe. Spends a lot of his life in Europe, constantly going back and forth, whether he's getting financial support to raise money for more printing presses or just going over there to help the United States later. More on that, more on that in a minute. He starts noticing that sometimes people can get to England a lot faster than other people can get there. And he starts charting where these boats are at. And Ben Franklin, ladies and gentlemen, figures out that there is a thing called the Gulf Stream Current. So we all like to go fishing and catch them big old whopper fish. That's because of Ben Franklin. We didn't know it existed until Ben figured it out. And he charted it. He was a cartographer, maker of maps. That's cartography. So Ben was the first one to map that. He also mapped a lot of the colony areas and stuff for the Queen. And with all these things Ben's got his hands on, it gives him a lot of political power. Everybody knows Ben. And then when Ben would write a book about electricity or science or politics, being civic stuff, everybody wants to read Ben's books. Ben's like Elon Musk. You know, Ben's Jeff Bezos. Ben uses his political power. He goes over to Europe. And at the time, the U.S. The colonies are getting really tired of being ruled by the Queen. So we're really secretly trying to plan a revolution. We, we want to get these redcoats off our land. So Ben goes to King Louis of France, and Ben's going to ask for money, because you can't have a war without money. So Ben at this time is this, you know, pretty stoic figure and has all of these crazy accomplishments in his life. So Ben tries to play up the fact that he's a scientist and a civic and um, business owner and he's also spent a lot of time in the wilderness. So Ben gets somebody to make him this crazy oversized fur hat because he wants to see King Louis and just amaze him with his Davy Crockett style exterior like he's a rough and rugged outdoorsman from the frontier. Ben wears this crazy hat to France. Women see the hat. It actually creates a whole entire fashion revolution called the, the Benway or the Benoit where all these ladies had to start getting these big fur hats. They could be as cool as Ben Franklin that came to France. So while Ben's over in France, he's talking to King Louis and he's like, hey, we're getting tired of the queen. Louis was no fan of the queen himself, but Britain's got a lot of money and are way bigger than Louis. So Louis decides, Ben, if I give you the money, 
and it helps you guys with your revolution. Can we be friends? Can we be allies? And Ben's like, absolutely. And for Louis, he gets to sit back and laugh while he sees Great Britain get into a war that he gets to watch, you know, front row seat to, that he doesn't have to participate in. So Ben Franklin basically, he did help us with the Congress, but more importantly, Ben Franklin goes out and borrows the money or gets the money that we use to fund the war that becomes the American Revolution that become, that turns us into the United States. So not only does Ben get us there, Ben also helps us set up things. Uh, ben is really big with the Bill of Rights. Remember, his brother gets arrested because he said something that the governor didn't like or printed something that the governor didn't like. So when it comes time to make that Constitution amendments, what do you think number one is? Hmm, there you go. Got that freedom of speech thing, don't we? Um, and, and there's a lot of them that Ben works with with other very, very smart people. And Ben Franklin absolutely was an unbelievable guy. Let's see here. Uh, ben is one of the first people to figure out how to make money. Not with the printing press. Ben had a belief that if you planned if you financially planned your life properly, you could become wealthy in a thing called compounded interest. To keep this simple, if you take a savings account and it takes five years for your savings account to double because you're being paid interest for the money sitting in the bank, the more five-year cycles you can get on that money, it starts exponentially growing. Before Ben dies, he leaves 2,000 pounds of silver roughly $2,000 to Boston and Philadelphia. But he puts rules on it because Ben's a politician and he knows how politicians are. I think we all do. No one can touch this money for the first 100 years except tradesmen, the hardworking people, if they need money to buy equipment and make their life better, they can apply for a loan only off, derived off the interest of the money and they have to pay it back, but it is only to be used to help hardworking people get a better foothold in the world. It's not a, it is a social program, but it does come with different rules. Now, that money sits there for 200 years. That is a many a seven to eight year cycles. Currently, that $1,000 that Ben gave to each town, 2,000 total, Boston is worth like five million and Philadelphia is like seven to ten million. That's how much that money and it has been spent down. Like they use it to build buildings with, uh, museums and stuff, and there's still that much money sitting there and it's just growing. Every day it sits there in that fund, interest is being paid on that money, and that money's growing. And that was Ben's way of showing everybody, hey, you can do this yourself. You can take five dollars and turn it into something big if you just have patience and have a plan. Um Let's see what else we've got here. Uh, da, 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 da. He makes a lending library for books. And uh, Ben, to me, what's the most coolest thing about Ben is if you read his autobiography. Uh, he actually was, in 1755, he was put in charge of building forts. At this time, we have came over to the U.S. and we're, you know, we're claiming all this land for ourselves and we're running natives out. We're running... Indians, Native Americans, completely off their land, and they're fighting back. So we end up having to create a series of forts for these battles. They just go and grab Ben and say, Ben, you're real smart. Go build them forts. Ben builds the forts. It's kind of where he got the rugged exterior going to meet King Louis. He's good at fighting. He's good at building fortresses and stuff. So we're going to wrap this up pretty quick because I get long-winded. We're going to now do some of Ben Franklin's famous, famous quotes. The first one of these teach life lessons, and believe it or not, Ben was a bit of a lover. So we're going to end this with some of Ben's famous marriage quotes, okay? So for life lessons, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. It's a pretty good one. Time is money. Do not trust your money to a person that likes to count other people's money. Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. We've all heard that one. 
Having been poor is no shame. Being ashamed of being poor is. That's a very good rule in life. Um, then we've got uh, how he thought you should act more in society. And some of this deals with business, but it's more like a good life set of life rules. Never ruin an apology with an excuse. I think we've all been there. I've given many of excuses in my day. I didn't fail the test. I just found a hundred ways to do it wrong. Instead of cursing the darkness, light a candle. There was never a bad peace or a good war. When you finish changing, you are finished. You may delay, but time will not. Well done is always better than well said. No gains without pains. Never leave for tomorrow what you can do today. You will find the key to success underneath your alarm clock. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. We are all born ignorant, but one must work really hard in life to maintain ignorance. Three may keep a secret if two of them are dead. He who lays with dogs shall rise with fleas. An investment in knowledge pays the best interest. And I will leave you people with five wonderful quotes from Ben about love. Love your enemies, for they will tell you your faults. Contentment makes poor men rich. Discontentment can make a rich man poor. That is true. Keep your eyes wide open before marriage and half shut after. Where there is marriage without love, there will be love without marriage. Why is proof that God loves us and wants us all to be happy? And that, my friends, concludes my wonderful little talk on Ben Franklin. We've got another guy planned for a, another character coming up. But I hope you enjoyed this. Just my way of having a little bit of fun. Thank you for watching. If you did like it, show it to a kid. Teach a kid some history. It makes them, have, it makes them make better decisions in life. Remember, Tales from the Vault. It's on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button.